NHK World TV from Japan. Welcome back to Newsline. I'm Yuko Antani in Tokyo. First, the headlines at this hour. Palestinians in Gaza are celebrating a ceasefire with the Israelis as both sides prepare for what could be a difficult stage in their negotiations. The Russian and Ukrainian presidents have met face to face for the first time over the fighting in Ukraine. And workers in Hiroshima continue a grim search for people buried by landslides a week ago. People living in the Gaza Strip and parts of Israel are leaving shelters and hoping they won't have to return. Israeli leaders have agreed to an open-ended ceasefire with Hamas, the group that controls the Palestinian territory. The truce, at least for now, ends a conflict that has stretched on for nearly two months. NHK World's Craig Dale reports. Palestinians in Gaza rushed into the streets to celebrate. They've been running from Israeli airstrikes for seven weeks. Now they seem confident it's safe to be out in the open. I feel happy and joyful, like all Palestinians do. Our family welcomes the truce agreement. Hamas leaders took a moment to boast. We are here today to announce Gaza's victory, said Hamas spokesperson Sami Abu Zuri, to declare we have won over the destructive Israeli power. That power exacted a steep cost. Israeli attacks flattened building after building. More than 2,100 Palestinians died, the vast majority civilians. Militants in Gaza fired off thousands of rockets at Israel. They killed more than 60 Israeli soldiers and several civilians. I want to come back to regular life. I don't want to go to the shelter. The roots of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, of course, go back decades, but more recent incidents triggered this war. Israeli leaders blamed Hamas for killing three Israeli teens. The bitterness deepened following the murder of a Palestinian teen. Three Israelis are on trial for what's considered a revenge killing. And so for weeks, they traded fire. Israeli leaders said they were working to dismantle Hamas rocket launch positions and command centers along with tunnels militants used to attack their country. Temporary truces came and went. Both sides finally signed off on an open-ended ceasefire after mediated talks by Egyptian officials. They agreed to halt attacks. Israel and Egypt will ease their restrictions on the border in Gaza to allow in humanitarian aid and building supplies. The Palestinian Authority, which controls the West Bank, will administer the crossings, not Hamas. The Israelis also agreed to expand a fishing zone for Gaza fishermen. Negotiations will resume in a month to talk about longer-term issues, such as Israel's demand for Hamas to disarm and a Palestinian request for the release of prisoners. Hamas leaders also want to talk about building a seaport in Gaza and rebuilding the territory's airport. And the Israelis want the remains of their soldiers to be returned. U.S. officials admit this ceasefire is just the beginning. Certainly, uh, there's a long road ahead, and uh, we're aware of that, and we're going into this eyes wide open. The Israelis say Hamas ended up approving an agreement it rejected a month ago. Ultimately, so much bloodshed could have been avoided. The Palestinians are keenly aware of all they've lost. Still, Hamas leaders will continue to paint this as a victory. They've fought three wars against Israel since 2008 and say they're ready for another battle. Maintaining a lasting calm will clearly be a complicated undertaking. Craig Dale, NHK World. The presidents of Ukraine and Russia have held their first one-on-one -on -one talks over the crisis along their common border. Petro Poroshenko and Vladimir Putin met to try to end the conflict in eastern Ukraine. They were not able to reach a deal, but they agreed to keep talking. Poroshenko and Putin have been trading criticisms over the fighting between Ukrainian forces and pro-Russian separatists. They've seen more than 2,000 people killed in fighting since April. They sat down together in Minsk, Belarus, behind closed doors. They also took part in discussions with the leaders of Belarus and Kazakhstan and the European Union's foreign policy chief. EU leaders have been pushing for a ceasefire. 
Putin said they discussed ways to stop the bloodshed, but he said the Ukrainian government should negotiate a ceasefire with the separatists. Violence in Ukraine is the country's internal matter. We can't discuss conditions for a ceasefire. Poroshenko said the separatists need to disarm before Ukrainian officials hold any talks with them. Now, Putin has been explaining why some Russian paratroopers were found in Ukrainian territory. He says they may have crossed the border accidentally. Putin says he was told that 10 soldiers were patrolling the border and may have strayed across. He says in the past, Ukrainian servicemen have entered Russian territory in armored vehicles without incident. He says he hopes this case will not cause problems either. Ukrainian defense officials announced on Sunday that they had detained their paratroopers in the eastern region of Donetsk. They say it's proof that leaders in Moscow are directly intervening to support pro-Russian separatists. Search teams in Hiroshima are still combing through the mud a week after heavy rain triggered landslides. Authorities have confirmed the deaths of 70 people. 18 other people are still missing. And more than 1,300 are living in temporary shelters. NHK World's Noriko Okada has the latest. About 3,000 police officers, firefighters and self-defense force personnel have been looking for people missing since the disaster. They are using heavy machinery to move boulders out of the way and to scoop up mud and debris. Much of their work has been focused on a certain district. More people died here than in any other area. Landslides buried these homes beneath the mud and rubble. Four members of one household were all reported missing after the disaster. Toshio Tominaga and his mother-in-law were found dead hours after the landslide. Searchers looked for Toshio's wife and daughter for days, but couldn't find them. Their house is completely gone. I think it's all but impossible to find them. But hopefully, they are in the same spot. I just feel sorry for them. Another relative was anxiously waiting for news on the two women. Toshio was found around there. I heard he and his wife were sleeping on the same floor, so her body must be around here too. Six days after the disaster, ASO finally got some news. Police officers told him that they found the bodies of his wife and daughter. I can't find any words to say. I just can't stop my tears. But at least I should take comfort in the fact that the family is finally together again. Frequent rain has forced recovery teams to halt their operations again and again. But workers aren't giving up in their search to find every missing person. Noriko Okada, NHK World. All right, time now to find out what's making headlines in the world of business now with Ron Madison. All right, thank you, Yuko. Let's start off uh, with the markets. Japanese share price is seeing modest gains today uh, after the U.S. stock indices, the Dow Jones and S&P 500, hit record highs. The upward momentum here in Tokyo uh, did seem to be fairly capped, though. The stock market moved without a lot of clear direction. For the latest, let's go to Mayu Yoshida, who's got all the latest uh, rundown for us at the Tokyo Stock Exchange. So, Mayu, it seems uh, trading not all that active today. That's right, Ron. And we saw quite a choppy trading session today with low volume. So let's go straight to the closing levels to see where the markets wrapped up this Wednesday. So it looks like share prices ended mostly flat, but the Nikkei average managed to bounce back from yesterday's one-week low at 15,534. And the broader topics ended slightly in the positive at 1,285. 
Now, at first, the Nikkei opened in the positive following a record closing high for the S&P. But the index soon shed gains, briefly dipping in the negative as the domestic market lacked fresh trading cues. Now, this made investors turn to minor stocks rather than market heavyweights. Now, today I was following JR Tokai or Central Japan Railway. Now, yesterday this company filed an application with the Transport Ministry to build the super fast maglev train connecting Tokyo and Nagoya. But the problem is, the total construction costs came to about $900 million more than the previous estimate. So, shares of Central Japan Railway went down 1.6%. But there's always a flip side to every story, as some stocks surged on this news. Construction farms like Tekken and Kajima both posted to this year's highs, but it looks like Tekken went under some profit taking in the afternoon. While Nippon Conveyor soared 27%, now investors are predicting that these companies may benefit from more orders for this super fast maglev train. All right, let's move on to currencies. Traders bought the dollar after a couple of strong U.S. figures, which are the doable goods and the consumer confidence data. But the dollar traded without much direction during Tokyo hours ahead of tomorrow's U.S. GDP numbers for the April to June period. Dollar yen is now at 103.96 to 98. Meanwhile, this morning, the euro hit another one-year low against the dollar, following the recent comments from European Central Bank President Mario Draghi that hinted at possible further policy steps. And against the yen, the single currency is trading at 136.99 to 137, hovering near a one-week low. Okay, that's a wrap from me. Back to Iran. All right, Mayu, thank you very much for that. Japanese officials want to free up the way consumers and businesses across the country get their power. So officials at Tokyo Electric Power Company are extending their reach. They're going to start supplying energy outside the geographical area in which they've worked for decades. People close to the deal say TEPCO executives have signed a contract with home appliance chain Yamada Denki. Starting in October, they'll provide electricity through a subsidiary to more than 60 of the chain's outlets in central and western Japan. The executives are hoping that in 10 years, they'll take in sales outside their current region of $1.6 billion. They're negotiating similar deals with other firms that have operations nationwide. Now, managers at Chubu Electric in central Japan have also begun supplying electricity outside their region. They're selling energy to companies in the Tokyo metropolitan area, which is TEPCO's turf. Now, analysts are watching to see if more competition will lead to lower electricity rates and better service. French President Francois Hollande is hoping to regain his popularity and boost the stagnant economy by appointing a new cabinet member. A 36-year-old former banker has been named the new economy minister. Emmanuel Macron has been serving as the president's economic advisor. He replaced Arnaud Montbourg, who stepped down after criticizing the government for its austerity measures. The French cabinet resigned en masse following Montbourg's departure. Hollande aims to boost the economy and regain the public support. Macron is said to have a vast network in the business sector. France's economic growth is expected to fall short of the government's target this year. Now, Hollande has been criticized about his economic policies. His approval rating are in his approval ratings are rather are in the teens, and that is a record low for a French president. Well, U.S. hamburger chain Burger King is set to become the world's third largest restaurant group. Company executives announced a merger with Canadian coffee and donut chain Tim Hortons. Only two companies will be bigger. That's McDonald's and Yum Brands, which operates fast food outlets such as KFC. The new company is expected to have annual sales of about $23 billion. Both Burger King and Tim Hortons are planning to keep their brand names. They expect the merger to give them an advantage in procuring food supplies. Analysts say the merger was motivated by tax concerns. The new company will be based in Canada, where corporate tax rates are lower than the U.S. Automakers from around the world are seeing a lot of promise in Africa. Those from Japan are trying to increase their share with a focus on service. NHK World Shinpei Fujino has more. Poor road conditions across Africa often cause vehicles to break down. Just return, but no need a trip. These mechanics have traveled to Japan to learn how to provide better maintenance in Africa. 
The program is run by Mitsubishi Motors. Company officials say after sales service is part of the strategy for African markets. The mechanics learn computer skills needed for advanced car maintenance. The things we are learning here, first of all, are more advanced than what we, we are used to in Kenya. So hopefully I will learn them and uh, take the knowledge back to Kenya, train my other colleagues. After sales service is not just about maintenance. Communication is also important. Mechanics in Japan talk with customers when they bring their cars in for maintenance. We offer tire coating for about $5. It protects the rubber from ultraviolet rays, which can cause deterioration. Let me know if you're interested. Can the tires begin to deteriorate within a year? If you leave them unprotected, they can. Today I have experience of that technicians should not always be cautioned about their job, that they should always be aware about other people. We're trying to provide the same level of customer support in Africa as in Japan. We hope that will help us sell more new vehicles.